Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture. Um, today I also will answer the Ilias questions here in the lecture and on the recording, okay, since they are related to the slides and so and maybe it's useful to do that. So let's see what you wrote. Um, you like it still, that's good, but not many people are participating in the um, questionnaire, but that's also okay. So I understand uh, blah blah, the lemma were not clear for me. Okay, so the lemma basically is showing you the way how the statements can be proven, but it's not showing you all the details, okay? But the things in the lemma are basically the steps that you need to understand, and they are like simple intermediate results that you should be able to work out, okay? With the help on the next slide where I kind of figured out what does A, B, and C, what constants are those? And when you plug everything in, everything is just plugging in stuff. So there's no magic happening anymore. But it's not all on the slides, okay? And so you cannot just understand it by looking at it. So you really have to take a piece of paper and go through it your, yourself, okay? If you want to have a deeper understanding here. Um, so the points in the lemma are made in such a way, actually we're interested in the multivariate distribution. However, when you look at the structure of the proofs, you see that they are exactly the same for the univariate. That's why we do the univariate first, write everything down, and then we just replace notation a little bit and replace scalars with vectors. And then the rest stays the same, the rest of the proof, okay? So I don't expect you to understand everything right away from such uh, derivation, okay? But everything is there for you to derive it yourself. Um, next thing is confusion about the bar and the Gaussian, whether it has something to do with the bar and the probabilities. Why replace a comma with a bar? That was just, so the bar is always a bar, it always means conditioned on, and there's always one bar. In one of the first lectures, I suggested an interpretation for having several bars, and I think it makes sense, but I don't know anyone who uses this, who conditions several times. It's just curious because kind of a condition distribution is a distribution. You could give it the letter Q of something conditioned on nothing, right? So you would have the probability of something conditioned on an event A, and you could say from now on I call it Q, and then for the Q you could again condition on other stuff. And so it's interesting, so what does it really mean if you do this, okay? So it was just to get you thinking of what these things really mean. Actually, there's typically only one bar. Now, in the last lecture, why didn't I put a bar in this curly N notation for the Gaussian? The reason was I wanted to view it just as a function that has three inputs, the X, the mean, and the variance. And then I can do things like switching the mean and the variable and other things, since those are just inputs to a function. And it's just about the term that describes the PDF whether this is true or false. But then actually, of course, it's a density, and so the correct way to think about it is that there's a function of x given two parameters, basically, right? And the bar is also telling us it's normalized with respect to the inputs on the left-hand side of the bar, yeah? And it's now the particular PDF for a particular choice of parameters, okay? So it is the same bar, and I replace it just to have the derivations nicer. Okay, and less confusing. So there's more confusing, confusion, than, uh, confusion than happening here. But I, I think it's good to think of these functions also just as expressions. And then you turn around and fill around with the symbols. Um, <coughs> next thing, how exactly have the matrices and vectors in the Gaussian function on slide 20 have been formed? So let's have a look at that one. So slide 20. So this is basically a notation where I, if those would be, if those were scalars, everything is fine, right? So this is a vector with two scalars, and this is a two-dimensional vector with two scalars. But in principle, of course, you can also stack, vertically stack two vectors on top of each other, and you get a longer vector. So for that, x and y must have the same number of columns, but not even the same number of rows, right? So x could be larger than y. There's nothing stopping you from that one. And the same for this one. Of course, since we put in both mu, they have the same length in this example, okay? What about these ones? It's also extending the notation where I'm basically now having a matrix of matrices, right? Which is totally fine, okay? So you could have a matrix of matrices. It's just this stacking function in NumPy, okay? Stacking stuff on top or next to each other, and each of them could also have a bigger dimension. 
When you work out the formula for the conical product of two matrices, that's exactly what you're doing there. Okay, you have two matrices, and then for each location in one of the matrix, you put the complete other matrix in there, scaled by the entry. So, and since those are just matrices here, I can compute what sigma inverse plus t inverse is. It's yet another matrix, and I put it to the left top corner of my new matrix, okay, and so on and so forth. Of course, you have to make sure that the number of rows of the top entry here is the same as the number of rows of the inverse t to the minus 1, okay? Otherwise, um, there's a size mismatch, okay? So you cannot stack it on top of each other. Similarly, the ones that are like in one column must have the same number of columns. Otherwise, it's not defined and it's unclear what it means, okay? So this is how you construct this matrix. So it's really just stacking. At the end, you have a really big matrix with scalars, but no one stops you interpreting a matrix with lots of scalars as a matrix with lots of submatrices. I guess it's similar to the Jordan decomposition, where along the diagonal, you also have some matrices in general, right? I hope that's true. I think you have it. If you have some multiplicity or some other things, I forgot, okay? But sometimes you have like matrices along the diagonal, and that's like the same idea. I hope that clarifies it a bit. Um, what else? Um, more comments. Okay, you think I'm motivated. That's good. Um, sometimes a bit too fast. Yeah, of course, stop me with formulas, right? And as I said, some formulas, I just put everything you need, right? And it took me sometimes hour to put this on these slides. But then I leave out like the trivial stuff. I leave out the steps where you just plug stuff into other things, okay? But all of the material, all of the ingredients should be on the slide. Um, then you like Jupyter notebooks, but after 90 minutes might be very hard. Yeah, then Jupyter notebooks are also like a gimmick at the end. And the problem is I want to show something from the lecture and translate it into code. So that is the idea. However, typically we don't have enough time, so I can just preview it. It's like a like a teaser, uh, like, a, like a trailer of another movie, yeah? and then you can play around with the code at home, okay? And it's super common that you have to look up all the functions that are used. Gee, that's how I wrote the code, right? I have to look up every function and find out how to get the right one for what I want to do. And then for your convenience, it's already there, and you can just look it up and see how it's used, okay? You have already a use case that you can use as your own starting point. Good, whatever. Okay, fine, the rest is okay. Good, so far so good. So that is the, uh, f the discussion from last time. Let's go on with more on distributions, a little bit on models and map and ML. And I reshuffled the whole lecture in the last hour again because always there, there comes questions and I put more slides in and it was becoming a bit messy and a bit out of order. So I try to reorder it. So please download the slides again if you have downloaded them two hours ago. They have changed already a lot again, okay? But let's see whether the ordering is now good. So the starting point is the Gaussian distribution. I just want to show you again what it is more to introduce the way now I'm presenting a distribution. So I'm presenting a distribution now here as follows. So there's a random variable x, and in this case it's real valued, so I give the range of it, okay? And then for the distribution there are certain parameters. So for the Gaussian we have a mu, which is called the mean, and some sigma squared, which has to fulfill some property called the variance. By the way, it must be really larger than zero, not greater or equal than zero. If it's zero, we have a division by zero arrow, okay? So then we cannot write down the density. And then we write x as a univariate Gaussian distribution. We can write it with this notation, and that's very common in statistics, maybe in statistics, but at least in machine learning, that you use this tilde notation. And the tilde notation says x is distributed according to the density on the right-hand side. And notice here, that is another shortcut here, so the x is omitted in this case. So sometimes the x is omitted and we say the curly n with parameter mu and sigma squared, that is the probability distribution, yeah, where I don't name the variable that it's describing. Yeah, it's just one possible distribution and it only has two inputs, the two parameters, yeah, and the x should be distributed according to it. Similarly, I could also write that the PDF of x is equal to this function, yeah? And sometimes we use one notation or sometimes we use the other notation, okay? Always make sure you know what you're writing. 
And this is just a function. Now I put the bar back in here because that's actually how we think about probabilities. And that is this expression over here on the right hand side. And I think I flipped already to the to the next slide. So this is the univariate version, and this is the multivariate version. Okay? And curiously, special case, so a special case of the multivariate one is the one-dimensional one, the univariate one. Okay? So that's how we talk about distributions. Okay. Um, what else did I want to say here? Yeah, maybe one thing. So for the univariate, for example, that's also a digression, okay? German an excurs. So something that is somehow irrelevant but curious and interesting. Okay, so here's another digression. So somehow you could also think about the space of all Gaussian distributions, right? What space is it? Is it the R or is it R to R square or R to the three or R to the four? What is it? And actually what it is, it is R to the two, but only the top half of it. Okay? Let me show you on the board. Um, it's also super, super interesting, but again, it's a digression, yeah, so don't worry. So and basically, this is how you could do it. So basically, you have a, a real valued location parameter, the, mu, the mean, okay? So it's somewhere here, and then you have a variance, so the sigma squared, so this should be a sigma, but you are not allowed to use the axis here. So every point here above the axis, okay? That is basically a Gaussian distribution. Yeah? Why is it nice? I mean, not only for mathematicians, also for computer scientists. For me, computer science or programming is like the art of abstraction also. We want to abstract stuff. So we not only talk about spaces of data points where we have coordinates, but we could also talk about spaces of distributions, right? How fancy is that? Of course, now, if we want to do Something like this, we could ask for the distance between two distributions. Wow, this is getting even more interesting, right? So you have two Gaussian distributions, and you're talking about the distance between them. And there are different choices. And if you know differential geometry, yeah, then you can calculate the curvature of the space. And then it turns out that the correct distance here to use will be the KL divergence, which is something from um, information geometry. So that's a particular way to compare two distributions. And it has a very nice interpretation. Actually, there's also a theorem of Pythagoras in here that holds, okay, that can be used. So it's super interesting stuff, okay? But this is just a digression which should show you, okay, it could be abstracted even further. By the way, why is it relevant? Um, suppose you do estimation or you have some algorithm which is kind of um, first seeing one data point, yeah, you might be here with your estimate, then you see the second data point, and then you are moving around in this space of distribution. With every new data point, you are updating your mean and your, your um, variance, okay? So this is now, you could think about how to do optimization in this space, or how to do gradient descent in this space, okay? And then there's the, the way, what is the right way to do this, okay? And there's the so-called natural gradient descent, that then uses the KL divergence and some super cool stuff, okay? This is just a preview. One could make a whole lecture on this. The topic is called information geometry, okay? And it's really interesting. I maybe Peter Arndt is doing something on it. So he was also here a, a, a professor. So, okay, so this is just a digression. So it's interesting. These objects here can be also seen like points in some distribution space, okay? Which is interesting. Um, so this is a multivariate distribution and everything just becomes vector and matrices. And typically when we talk about the Gaussian, we are talking about that one, okay? We are always talking about the multivariate one. When you look at some probability or statistics books, they talk a lot about the univariate one and it's interesting. And then some comes something super difficult, the multivariate Gaussian distribution. However, this is our, our working horse that we will play around with when we talk about Gaussian processes and these kind of things. So this is the one that we want. And here just the change is now we have a vector as the location, right? And then the covariance is the whole matrix. Of course, going back to this weird interpretation, now the thing gets much higher dimensional, right? So you have one axis or some r to the d, right, for the location, and then you have some r to the d squared for the matrices, but only a submanifold of the matrices, the ones that are positive definite. Okay? Super interesting stuff. 
luckily for us, not relevant for you right now. However, su suppose you want to write a nice machine learning paper, become a famous researcher, right? When you know differential geometry and you see the connection, suddenly you can write really nice papers about this. And you might have insights that are not possible for the mere mortal computer scientists, but only the ones who know the enough mass. They suddenly see connections, and then you can define new algorithms, new optimization algorithms, based on these abstract ideas, OK? Good, so that is the Gaussian distribution. It has nice properties. It's closed under the sum and product rule, which is super for inference, because those are the two steps that we typically do, OK? We've seen that last time. Again, you don't have to memorize this, but when you look at the formulas and you try to understand them, typically they make sense. If they don't make sense, the formula must be wrong, OK? So they, they ha should have also some good interpretation. Otherwise, there's a typo. So there are many more distributions. So this is uh, um, from some paper on univariate distribution relationships from these two authors from the American Statistician 2008. So I show you again. And those are all univariate distributions in this case. Um, so for example, where is the, this is the standard normal distribution up here. Standard normal meaning you have mean being equal to zero and variance being equal to one. And then there's the so-called normal distribution, which we typically call Gaussian distribution. It has two parameters, mu and sigma squared. You're probably not able to see it here on, this, um, on the screen now, but that's fine. If you now apply certain operations, for example, squaring it, um, then suddenly you, you get like the chi-squared distribution and some other. And they are all somehow interestingly related. Now suppose you have something that you measure in nature and you know something about the physical relationships between two quantities. Typically you know the nonlinear relationship and then this translates typically into new interesting um, distributions. Okay, so that's, and there's a whole zoo of those. Of course, nobody expects you to know these. Only if you are maybe a professor for probability distributions, you should know most of them, right? But typically, you should just be aware that there are so many, OK? So let's look at a couple of them. So a distribution for waiting times. I am just put it in here for um, completeness. So there's a Poisson distribution, yeah? And I just want to show you that this exists. It's for counting rare events, for example. And if you count, in principle, you start with zero, right? So you won't have negative counts. So it's the values that you can get are zero, one, two, three, and so on. So all natural numbers, including the zero. Um, it has one parameter, which is also called the rate. And then we would write for, write, for example, x is distributed according to a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda, OK? So that's how you would read it. And it has a probability mass function. So it's not a density function, because this is not a continuous distribution, but it's a discrete distribution, but with countably infinite possibilities, OK? So as many outcomes are possible as there are natural numbers. Of course, when you do real-world experiments, you're always counting until some finite number, right? But there's no limit to the numbers at the end. One curious theorem from mass that you might have seen that e to the l Right, is can be written like an, like a like some series, some summation of some infinitely many terms, and those are exactly the terms here. And that is exactly the proof how to prove that if you sum up all of these, it will be equal to one. Okay, that's you just take the series for the exponential function, and then you have it. That's where these weird terms come from. Okay, it also shows you that kind of the lambda gets taken to the power of x. So. That means that depending on the number of events that you have, it's, if it's getting really, really large, somehow lambda to this can also get really, really large, OK, if you have a rate that is like rate being equal to 5. However, you divide by an even faster growing function, divided by the factorial of x, OK? And by this, you are limiting it again. And typically, it will have looks like, a, like some bump, OK? Let me show you a picture. So the Poisson distribution um, looks approximately like this. So it is a discrete one. So in principle, I have all these numbers. And I can draw like columns for those. Yeah? So it could be like this. But for convenience, I, I could draw it also with a line. But it's only defined for the integers. Um, more general. If you do this, um, 
it will look like something like this or or so. So it also it's, it's it's one that is not symmetric. So it's typically have a heavier tail on one side than on the other side. However, if lambda is getting really large, yeah, then the whole thing looks almost like a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so there's a theorem: if lambda gets large, the Poisson kind of looks like a Gaussian, but being defined on the integers. So there are some subtleties. So that's just some background information on the Poisson. In general, I find the Wikipedia page is super good for mathematical topics or computer scientist topics. So there you find everything on these topics typically, and it's all collected on one page. Super useful. So curious, pros, uh, curious property of the Poisson distribution: the expectation is lambda, and also the variance is lambda. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. So what does it mean? That means on average. Yeah, happen your rare event with the rate lambda, so lambda being equals five, then on average you will see five events. Okay? And then you can ask, so what is the spread? The spread around the five is also five. Okay? That's interesting. Um, the other thing is if you have 500, like the as the average event, then your spread will be also 500. Okay, so it will have a very wide spread. So that's a nice particular property here. By the way, I mean, the expectation is something like the, um, yeah, in a way, it's a first order moment. Now it's becoming very handshakily, okay, but it's like the first order moment, which is like something like the first derivative, or not the derivative at all, and the variance is something to the square. It's like the second derivative. So the derivatives are all the same which is exactly what's the case for the e function, right? All the derivatives are just e to the x. And that's how it plays out for probabilities that all these parameters are the same, OK? But it's a bit hand wavy. One would have to work it out. Another example is the number of emails you receive every day. That's also Poisson distributed, OK? And of course, the rate can change during the day, yeah, depending on whether people sleep or not. Another one is waiting time between events. Suppose you have like a, a gas station, and then the cars coming in also distributed according to a Poisson distribution. Okay, that's just another example of a probability distribution. We won't use it very often. Here are more interesting distributions, which are more interesting for us. Distributions on tossing dice. Okay, so there are different possibilities. So. There's the two dice, and the, the two dice is a dice with two sides. It's also called a coin, OK? So a coin is, in principle, also a dice. So the simplest random device is a coin. And you can throw it n times. And now we can talk about the distribution, about um, how often do we see heads. This random variable has a possibility from 0 to n, right? Since we throw it only n times, we cannot see more than n heads. Um, there's a parameter, the probability of seeing heads, so that's like a material parameter of the coin, okay, whether it's bended or bent or not. And then we say the x has a binomial distribution, and we write it like this. x is distributed according to bin n comma theta. So the n is important, right, because it tells us something, how often did we throw the coin. And then the x is just counting how often we've seen heads. So it's also counting events in a way, but different from the Poisson. There's also a probability mass function for it. And this is one that you could work out with super basic stuff, right? So you have a probability for seeing heads, which is theta, and you take theta to k. And you have um, a probability for not seeing heads, which is 1 minus theta, and you take it to the power of the rest. OK? Then you might wonder, so where does now this binomial coefficient come from? That's our Zustandssumme, OK? So that is basically the normalizing factor that ensures that the whole thing um, integrates to 1 or that it's summed up to 1. So with other words, if you take this expression here and you sum it up um, over all possibilities, yeah, you will get exactly a formula for the binomial coefficient. OK? So and there's a theorem on this that this is true. The expectation of such a variable is n times theta. So what does it mean? Suppose you n is equal to 100 and theta is 50 uh, percent, uh, so 0 0.5. Then you would expect, on average, to see 50 times heads. Okay? If your variable, uh, if your theta is 0 0.1 and you throw 100 times, you would expect to see like 10 um, times heads. Okay? But as 
I said on average, okay? So on average means every one of us is throwing 100 times the coins and writing it down, and then we can calculate the average over all your outcomes, and that would then be approximately 10, okay? There's also something about the variance. It also has a very interesting form. So let's look at it. So suppose theta is very small, 0 0.00001. Then this product will be also super small, okay? So what does it mean? The probability of heads is very, very low. That means that we are most likely having x equals 0, or maybe very rarely. But we don't have a widespread for the x. So the x is very deterministic. At the other end, we would have theta being equal to 1. Then 1 minus theta is almost 0, OK? And in that case, the spread is also very small. Yeah? So we almost always see x being equal to n, OK? So some of the variance exactly expresses the fact that if we are close to 0 for the probability or close to 1, in both cases, the variance is very small. And when is it maximized? It's maximized when basically when we have um, theta being equal to a half, OK? Um, it's also easy to plot it. I, I plot it for you. So this variance can be plotted for different parameter values. Um, and it's just, so it's a parabola, right? So it's theta times 1 minus theta, which is equal to theta minus theta square. So the minus theta square means it's a parabola which is open to the bottom. And then we know at the location 0, it must be 0, and at the location 1. And the rest is the parabola shape, and it's symmetric. So in here will be exactly a half. OK, that's how the variance looks. And it doesn't matter what the n is. The n is now just scaling the thing up and down. OK, that's it. So curious. By the way, that's, that's how you should at, look at formulas when you see them sometimes. You should plot them. You should think about them, different special cases. OK, what do they mean? OK, this is just in general, I think, a good idea. OK, so that is the binomial distribution. Let's throw the coin only once, OK? Then we have the so-called Bernoulli distribution. So this is now a special case of the previous one. So let's see how I wrote it down. Um, I wrote it down that the random variable x is now just 0, 1. So it's a binary variable. There are only two possibilities. Again, theta is, has the same property, but the n is now equal to 1, OK? Or with other words, let me see, the Bernoulli theta is the same as the binomial 1, comma theta. So the distributions are basically the same. OK? By the way, that's also why it's, it's fun to think of these objects like point in some space. Then, then you can write down these, these equations, right? So there's a space of all Bernoulli, ex Bernoulli distributions. And it is a subspace of the space of all binomial distributions, OK? Um, also, this binomial distribution space is kind of interesting because it's discrete in one axis and continuous in another one, OK? Just curious, curious. So now, what about the density or the mass function? It is exactly the one that we've seen before, where now we use this Iverson bracket here. So basically, we use a clever notation to obtain for x being equal to 1, we want to have theta. And for x being equal to 0, we want to have 1 minus theta, uh, 1 minus 0, OK? We could have just raised this to the power of x. That would have been another possibility. Yeah? You could just say theta to the power of x, 1 minus theta to the power of 1 minus x, OK? That would have been another possibility. And here you see that it's a special case. But this is just a complicated way to talk about the Bernoulli distribution, yeah? which is super simple for throwing a coin. OK, so I, I told you something about dice. So let's generalize this now to the k-sided dice. Yeah? Typically, we have a six-sided dice. But there are also other dice. And we throw it n times. This is a multinomial distribution. And here I now try to use similar notation as on the previous slide so you see the different connections. So suppose you throw a dice k times, uh, n times. Then you will have different outcomes. And you can record them by writing down a k-dimensional vector where in each of the entries you count how often did you see a 1, how often did you see a 2, and so on and so forth, OK? However, this vector has a special property that the sum of all entries is equal to n, OK? That's just the special property of this vector. Then we also have a parameter vector now, since we not have a coin with one number, but now for a six-sided dice, in principle, we need six numbers or five numbers, since we get one for free. OK, with these 
properties here. So, and typically theta sub j is the probability of seeing psi j of my dice. Uh, we write it now that the x has a multinomial distribution, and note now that the x is a vector, and the theta is also a vector here, okay? But that's typically fine. And the probability mass function is just generalizing the binomial distribution. Again, we have theta to the power of the counts, but now we do it for each theta j separately and take them to the power of xj, okay? And we need a normalizing factor in front, and there is a so-called multinomial coefficient, which I've never seen before, but it happens to be here in the multinomial distribution, and actually it's a simple generalization. Right, you know the normal binomial coefficient is basically this formula for k being equal to 2. Okay, that's exactly the formula that you have. But typically you write instead of x2, you will write n minus x1. Or you write for the x1k, and for the x2 you would write n minus k. Okay, so that's the usual formula. But you can generalize it. And I'm sure you could come up with some board game or some card game where these numbers are relevant to calculate the number of card distributions or something. Yeah? For sure they are. So this is multinomial. Here comes a nice, uh, then you, we could also calculate the mean and the variance, so let's do that. So it's, it's a, the mean is a vector, of course, um, which is just n times these single probabilities. So that's what we see on average, okay? And it's a vector. And there's also a curious matrix now being the covariance here, right? So the variance for a vector valued random variable is also called the covariance matrix. Why? Because typically we only talked about the variance, which are the entries on the diagonal, and those are you're already familiar with. But here are some interesting entries also on the off diagonal, okay? And they tell you, suppose x2 is super large, what does it mean for the other variables? And the minus sign here tells us that if x2 is super large, it means that all the other variables are very small. Okay, right, which makes sense because kind of you were lucky of having a couple of times throwing a two, if that's your game, okay, and then the other numbers must be smaller. So they are negatively correlated with each other. If one is large, all the others are small, okay, and vice versa. And the exact value depends on the probabilities that you have here, okay? Good. So on the diagonal, we have the typical variances of the single coordinates. On the off diagonal, we have the so-called covariance, which sometimes is also written as a scalar for two univariate variables. And it could be written like this, okay? So that's basically, it's curious that it's getting so interesting already with so simple distribution. So I was really surprised when I looked up this um, variance of the multinomial because it was missing in the slide. So a couple of days I put it in and it was very interesting. So then there comes a fun, ex um, fun invention of these I think this is machine learning. I think it's the David Barber book, which is downloadable as a PDF, where I got it from. And he um, comes up with the multi-nulli distribution, yeah, which is like a made-up word. It's a mixture of Bernoulli, which I think is a name, yeah, and multinomial. And so he calls it, I think he calls it multi-nulli, or some people do it, which is tossing a k-sided dice once. It's like tossing a coin once, and this is tossing a dice once, okay? so. In this case now, um, we will have a vector of outcomes where only one of the entries is allowed to be one. All others are zero because I'm tossing it only once, okay? This is also happening in, um, in deep learning. There's a so-called one-hot encoding, which you might have seen. So this is exactly what's happening here. It's like a classification situation. You throw a dice, and then the class is the outcome of the dice, okay? And then basically the class label is not stored by a number from one to six, but it's stored in a vector where one entry is one, okay? And this looks a bit more complicated, but then if you write down the rest, everything gets nicer. So you can just write down the probability mass function as a, basically as a special case of the multinomial distribution, which is good, right? And um, it also has a name being the categorical distribution. Category is uh, another word for different classes, right? So you have different outcomes, different possibilities that are discrete and typically finitely many, okay? Like on a dice, okay? And that's also in many classification problems the case. So it's so called also categorical distribution or the discrete distribution. So those are more common names. However, I like the multi-nulli name. I think that's kind of makes, makes sense. So 
tossing a dice. In general, we throw it n times and have a k-sided dice. Um, and then basically, we have all these different cases. So the general case is a multinomial. For n equals 1, we have the multi-nulli case. Yeah, and we have the relation that the categorical distribution of theta is equal to the mu of 1, comma theta. And then there's the binomial distribution and the Bernoulli distribution. And you can also view it as a matrix. So basically, the k being equal to 2 and n being equal to 1 is like the simplest one. It's a Bernoulli one. And then there are these steps of specializing from binomial to Bernoulli or from multinulli to Bernoulli. Or you can also specialize from multinomial to Bernoulli by doing it twice. Again, for the mathematicians, just for fun. So this is like a commutative diagram, right? Doesn't matter which way you go. You will always get the same distribution. So, and here it's, it's written out basically this property, right? So the Bernoulli thing can be seen as a binomial, as a multinomial, and also as a categorical. This is a lot of formulas, a lot of symbols, but it's just worked out, okay? And so it's not difficult. It's just, I wrote it out very extensively for you, which is actually super simple stuff. But it's nice to have it all in a nice notation on one point. Because then when you see somewhere multi, multinomial distribution, sometimes it's confusing when you see it, how people write it up. And then you know actually it's just tossing a, tossing a dice n times. So that's a multinomial distribution. And then basically, so it's like, I think the typical example of the multinomial distribution in textbooks is you have a big lake and you are um, getting fish out of the lake and there are like different uh, types of fish and you are getting out, let's say, five fish. And then the distribution will be a multinomial distribution of five comma the distribution of the different fish, okay? And it's fitting to the tossing dice example. Good, so far so good. Um, it's curious now, so here's the unknown, or the, the, the data that we observe basically is the result of our experiment of tossing a dice. So that is the result. We are the physicists sitting there with the dice and we throw it and then we can write up our data. Okay, so that is the data generation process. However, in principle, we are interested in inference, so inferring basically the unknown parameters of the dice or the unknown parameter of the coin. So before throwing a dice, the result of the dice is unknown, so I model it with a random variable, right? Now having a Bayesian hat on, yeah, I would also model now my parameters as random variables. And now what would be good distributions for those parameters? And Curiously, we've seen already the better distribution, that's one candidate, and it can be also generalized for the multinomial, and that's something we will want to look at next, okay? So what distribution should we choose for the parameters, okay, which are also unknown, and why not describe them also with probabilities? For this, we've seen already the beta binomial model, okay? Where now the name says beta being the prior, binomial being the likelihood, so the data generating process. And the beta binomial bi model is basically combining that. So we have a certain parameter we want to estimate. Given the parameter, we have a certain way of making observations, the k. And then having these observations, we want to calculate the posterior distribution of the theta. Yeah, so let's start at the top. So our experiment is that we are flipping repeatedly a coin, yeah, or I'm going through the rows and checking who is wearing glasses, okay? Um, and we don't know the probability of having hats or of having glasses on, okay? Um, then we would write our data just as k being the number of hats. We also did it that it was the first person was x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x7, and so on. Basically now, this information can be summarized in k, right? Because we are just interested in the number of positive outcomes, okay? And um, it doesn't change the relevant f stuff. In statistics, we would say the k is a sufficient statistics for x1, x2, x3, and so on and so forth. Because like everything that we can infer from k can be, uh, everything that can be inferred from x1, x2, x3, and so on, which are Bernoulli variables, can be also inferred from k, okay? So, k is the data, just a summary of it. The ordering also doesn't make sense in which I'm seeing you, okay? And then, basically, first I'm expressing my prior as a beta distribution now, and I will explain again what the beta distribution is for completeness. Then I'm having my observation 
where I'm saying the observation is coming from a binomial distribution. And then if you go through the math using Bayes rule, you can derive that the posterior will be also beta distribution which this super intuitive parameters. So what's intuitive about it? Suppose A and B are equal to one, which corresponds, for example, to a uniform distribution. Um, then observing k times seeing heads, it would change now the parameter A plus k, and the B is changed with n minus k, so with the other outcomes. So suppose I have thrown 100 times, I'm seeing 75 times heads, and k is equal to 75. So I would increase the parameter a by 75, and I would increase the parameter b by 25. Yeah? And from the nice code demo, you see that then the whole thing will shift to the right location, to 0 0.75, right, to 3 quarters, with some spread depending on the size of a and b. Okay? So basically, the beta distribution, you just can plug in the counts of seeing heads, and then you get the distribution completely. Good. By the way, those are two possible ways to write down the same stuff. So you could either write it like this, then you would write the theta also on the right-hand side, or you write it like that, then you typically omit the theta if it's clear what you're talking about. Okay? Good. So what is the beta distribution? Now using a similar notation as before, the random variable is now coming from the continuous interval from 0 to 1. Okay? We have two parameters, both being greater than 0. Um, the notation I used already above, it has a certain probability density function. And here you might ask, huh, didn't I see it already? Isn't that the probability mass function of the binomial distribution? And actually, Yes, it is. It's exactly the same one. However, this time it's not a distribution over A and B as for the binomial distribution, but now it's a distribution of the theta. Okay? That's why we also have a different normalization constant. As you know, the normalization constant is calculated by summing out all possibilities. So for the binomial, it would have been all possibilities of A and B. Okay? However, here we are summing out all possibilities for theta. So we need to normalize it with the integral of this function integrated over theta. And that is exactly the definition of the beta function. Yeah? Where the beta function is like some beast, I guess it's appearing somewhere in physics, where people have an integral which looks exactly like that, and it's too difficult let's invent a name for it. And then you just have a new name and you create a big table that you print out for people who want to compute it. Okay? So that's, I think, where the beta function comes from. Curiously, it's related to the gamma function, which is like a similar um, intimis, uh, in intimidating function, which is also looking very difficult. So I have a slide for you on that one. I've, I've shown it already. So basically, the beta function is defined to be this integral, period. No one expects you to solve this integration here. You don't. You give it a name. And then whenever you want to s you write down the integration here, the solution to the integration, you just gave it a name. It's a beta function. Okay? I cannot solve it. I'm just using it from NumPy or SciPy. I import a beta function, and then I have all the numbers. Yeah? I never do the integration. You can try the integration, right? I mean, it looks like, ah, oh, there you could some tricks. and doing some, some your, your, your kung fu for integration, your rules you can apply. Do it. I mean, it's fun. I couldn't do it. I, I weren't able to solve it. Okay? I guess that's why people were in inventing a name for it. Good. And one can show that it's related to the gamma function, which is a similar integration. And it's also nasty. Okay? And it's also such a nasty integral, which unfortunately happens to be suddenly on my sheet of paper if I'm a physicist. Okay, but it's too nasty. I just give the solution a name. I call it gamma of Z. However, then curiously, you can show some nice properties of it. So in principle, it's defined for all complex numbers, whatever that is. Okay, but on the real numbers, on the real line, if you look at the integers, at the positive integers, at the natural numbers, curiously, the gamma function is calculating the factorial. Okay, so that's really fantastic. So it's like a continuous version of the factorial function. Yeah, the factorial function is like best friend of all computer scientists. That's how we learn recursion, right? 
So you have very positive emotions against this factorial. And there's a continuous version of it, too. So you should have positive emotions to the gamma function, too, OK? Even though it has such a weird form up here, OK? Also, it's, I find it fascinating, this, I mean, it's defined by an algorithm, right, this factorial function. We define it with a recursive equation. And it's curious that you can write it down with a supposedly closed form solution as such a weird integration. I think it's fascinating. But I don't have to solve the integral. That's the most important thing. I won't. Good. But so if the gamma is the factorial function, we see why this kind of makes sense, right? So suddenly, this looks like a binomial coefficient, right? But the other way around. Typically, we have the, the n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial. And this is kind of turned upside down, yeah? So here we have the summation, which is like the n. The x is like the k, and the y is like n minus k, OK? So actually, there's even a formula to that. So the exact relationship between the beta, this beta function and the, the binomial coefficient is this one here. So it's the inverse binomial coefficient. So now what's important for you here? Just when you see the, the beta function, you should know, oh, that's just the inverse binomial coefficient, but generalized to all real numbers. Similarly, the gamma function is just a generalization of the discrete function of the factorial, OK? And maybe it should remind you that there's some fascinating field where people can have a recursive definition of a function and then can come up with an integral for this, OK? Which I think is quite fascinating. Good, so this is the beta distribution. So what you need to memorize just that it looks like the binomial, but the roles of the parameter and the input kind of is switched here, OK? Good. It also has a mean. So the mean is just a divided by a plus b, which is just if a is the number of observations of seeing heads and b is the number of observations of not seeing heads, that's just the usual estimator that you intuitively would use, right? So the number of successes divided by the number of attempts. It has a more complicated looking variance. And I guess it's due to the fact that somehow it's all happening on the interval 0 to 1. OK, so the density is 0 everywhere else. And that's why the variance is somewhat a bit more complicated. It also has a mode. Mode is also in statistics just meaning maximum of a function. So the mode of a random variable or the mode of a density is just its maximum. OK, it's just another word for it. And it also has a nice form, very much related to the expectation. OK, so that's a better distribution. Of course, so since we talked about the binomial distribution, so what happens if we would plug in here, um, if we would talk about the parameter of a multi, um, multinomial distribution? There must be a distribution too, right, that kind of generalizes the beta distribution from a single random variable here to like a whole vector of random variable, which sums up to one. And there is one, and that's called the Dirichlet distribution. And when you first see the Dirichlet distribution, it looks complicated, but it's just the natural generalization of the beta distribution. And with natural, I mean, if you look at the Dirichlet distribution for k equals two, you have exactly the beta distribution. OK, so it's just a generalization for having a prior distribution on the parameter of a six-sided dice. That's the Dirichlet distribution. And now that means now these thetas here, they must sum up to one, OK? And they must be all greater than 0. That's it. So with other words, before we had like the interval from 0 to 1 for our parameter theta, now we basically have these I, I call this simplex, right? Do you remember? So it's like the triangle in 3D, or it's the tetrahedron in high dimensions. So just numbers that sum up to 1, OK? And it's a di distribution on that space. Good, so we also have a parameter vector now. In this case, we have for each of the outcomes a different parameter. But let's look at the formulas. Everything's just the same. Yeah, so we still have these parameters. So let me show you the one that we had before. So here we had like theta to the positive outcomes, and then 1 minus theta to the negative outcomes, which is like saying here I have theta 1 to something, to a1, and here I have theta 2 to a2. And of course, I could have theta 3 to a3, and so on and so forth. And that's just what the Dirichlet distribution is doing. So it's just taking all the different thetas. And typically, now the letter a has been replaced by an alpha. Okay, 
but the meaning is the same. It's exactly the same. What about the normalization constant? That is just a generalization of our beta function. So that is a generalized beta function, okay? Where I'm now having, an, as an input, I'm having a whole vector of numbers. And of course, this is a generalized binomial coefficient. This is exactly the inverse of the multinomial coefficient yeah, that we've seen before. It's a multinomial distribution. So why am I showing you all these details? Just because I want to show you it's simple stuff. Yeah? It's just different things that look complicated, but they are really simple. They are, they are chosen in such a way that everything works. Right? So this, B, this generalized beta function, it's, it's a really a complicated thing in a way. However, for us, it's not. It's just a normalizing factor. It's just a result of integrating this stuff here with respect to theta. Okay? So it's, and that's it. That's the property we need from it. We don't need more from it. And you also don't need to do more with it. Okay? Good. So far, so good. So that is the Dirichlet distribution. Um, and of course, there's a special case for the beta a comma b distribution. That's the same as the Dirichlet, where I now put it into a vector shape, the parameters. Okay? So to have a, the parameter vector alpha. So let's get to the beta binomial model back, right? So that is what we've seen already. Um, it also, there's some other curious thing here to say. The prior and the posterior have this, are the same distribution, right? And in that case, we would say the beta distribution is the conjugate prior for the binomial likelihood. Okay? That is just like a sentence where you can plug in different things. So if my likelihood is a binomial distribution, because that's the best description on how my data is generated, then a good choice for the prior of my unknown parameters is the beta distribution. Why is it a good choice? Because then the posterior will be also a beta distribution. Okay? And you know how the posterior is derived. It's applying Bayes rule. So it's multiplying those two things here divided by the integration of the whole thing. And so it's something really nice and useful if there's we get some very simple shape for the posterior. If you do other choices, typically you cannot calculate the posterior yeah, in any nice fashion. The other nice thing why this conjugacy is in a, a big deal is so your, your today's posterior is your tomorrow's prior. So today I made some experiments starting with the prior and getting a posterior. Tomorrow I continue, okay? And then my prior is my posterior from today. And I have new flips of coins, and I want to update my posterior again to get yet another posterior. And then it's good if it all stays in the world of beta distributions. And again, of course, you could think of the space of all beta distribution, which is like the positive orthant, since A and B must be both positive. And then basically these observing and flipping coins is like giving you a trajectory through the space of beta distributions, yeah? which I think is a fascinating view. So we can do the same with the Dirichlet distribution. We can have the Dirichlet multinomial model, right? And it shouldn't intimidate you now anymore because it just says you have a parameter vector since you are not having a coin but a dice or you have a lake with fish, okay? And you have a prior over these parameters, okay? And that is now a Dirichlet distribution because the beta is only for two options. The Dirichlet is for many options, okay? And one can show if you go through the mass, the posterior will be also a Dirichlet distribution. Let's look at the parameters. It's just what we expect. We just add up our observation. So the alpha is a vector, and the x is a vector of outcomes, and we're just adding them up. Let's look back to the better one. That was exactly what we are doing here. Okay? So it's the same thing. And again, we can write down this fancy sentence. Since prior and posterior have the same distribution, we say that the Dirichlet distribution is the conjugate prior of the multinomial likelihood. Okay? So if you want to impress someone on a party, so that would be a good catching phrase. But then maybe nobody wants to dance with you anymore. So I don't know, whatever. So what else can we do with it? A little digression, just since it's so nice. What about the Gaussian Gaussian model? Okay? I don't know whether any, I called it now the Gaussian Gaussian model yeah? because it fits the previous slides. So here I'm sampling n times from a univariate Gaussian distribution with some unknown mean 
And for simplicity, let's assume the variance is known to be 1 or to be whatever, OK? And we're having a prior on this mean. Yeah? We know how the sizes of people is approximately with some variance and so on and so forth. And it's a Gaussian distribution. And we have a certain likelihood. In this case, I wrote it down already for several observations. So it's IID data, so all the likelihoods are multiplied with each other, and they are also Gaussian. So the prior is Gaussian, the likelihood is Gaussian. Then we've seen that the posterior will be also Gaussian, and there are some fancy formulas from last lecture. So also for the Gaussian, we can say this super cool sentence. Since the prior and posterior have the same distribution, we say that the Gaussian distribution is the conjugate prior for the Gaussian likelihood. Okay? So that is conjugacy. And conjugacy has typically those other natural choices, right? But sometimes it's a bit cheating. Natural also, those are the choices where we can do the computations as a Bayesian, right? And if we don't do that, things get messy and we need sampling or we need Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo or we need something not so nice. So there's a whole table on conjugate prior on the Wikipedia page here. Um, so some people have worked out more. Okay, so here's the one Bernoulli likelihood beta distribution. Okay, so that's good. Binomial likelihood beta distribution. That's what we learned already. But there are some others. Negative binomial also the beta distribution. Interesting. Wow, Poisson distribution. Then your prior for parameter lambda should be a gamma distribution. Yeah, if you do that, your posterior will be also a gamma distribution, which is super cool. And here are also the update formulas of the hyperparameters. So there are the prior hyperparameters. Here what it was A and B, or alpha and beta. And then there are the posterior hyperparameters, or we just call them parameters. You just add up the number of times you've seen heads or something. And you can also have this for Poisson, which is quite nice. For categorical, we have Dirichlet, which is multinomial Dirichlet. Those were tossing a dice once. This is tossing a dice several times. But here are more. There's a hypergeometric, and it's getting more complicated. Normal with normal, normal with normal. Now, if you want to infer the variance, you should use for the variance the inverse gamma distribution. OK, that's a conjugate prior for estimating the variance. What if you want to estimate both, and you need the normal inverse gamma distribution, whatever that is? And it's getting more fancy. For the multivariate normal, you have the multinormal normal. But suppose you, you know the mean and want to infer the covariance matrix, there's the inverse Wishart distribution, for example. Wow, that's why we need it. We want to have these conjugate priors for things, OK? And they all exist. So the inverse Wishart distribution is a distribution on covariance matrices, OK? Only on the positive definite matrices, OK? Quite nice. And so on and so forth. So there are many more, or not so many more. So we're almost through the list. But anyway, this is all quite interesting stuff. And it has a nice interpretation, typically. Good, so far so good. So here's a link to the long list of priors and likelihoods. So quick summary about tossing coins and dice. So for the outcome, we have these um, Bernoulli and Multinoli distributions. For the parameters, we have the beta and the Dirichlet distributions. Okay, and they, they are a good match to each other. So far, so good. So that was like an overview of many different um, distributions. Um, now, so great, we have a posterior, and we have a nice form of the posterior, but my um, client wants a point estimate, right? So my client wants to have a number. He doesn't, is, he's not happy with saying, OK, great, so nice coin that you gave me. I made some experiments. Here's a posterior distribution on the possible outcomes after seeing a couple of tosses. The customer may, now what is your estimation for the parameter of seeing heads? I want to have a fixed number, OK? So that's something that you typically do in classical statistics. You want to calculate a fixed number from your observations and not a posterior distribution like the Bayesian would do. So how can we get a point estimate now? Um, luckily, we have everything now at hand, and we can use the posterior, or we can ignore it and calculate um, some estimators. So suppose now that we have um, some data. Um, for example, it was the k in the beta binomial model, the number of times I'm seeing heads. 
Now we want to summarize the posterior with a point estimate. So one is that we take the maximum a posteriori estimator, the map estimator, which is just the theta that is maximizing my posterior distribution. Okay? So that is a possible way to summarize my posterior distribution with one single number. I take the maximum. Okay? We will see why that might be a bad choice sometimes, but it is a possibility to get a single number, which also intuitively kind of makes sense. Another one is to take the maximum likelihood estimator, and that is now a non Bayesian estimator. Why is it non Bayesian? It's not looking at any priors or at any posterior or something, it's just looking at the likelihood. So it's maximizing the likelihood. So now you know why the maximum likelihood estimator is called maximum likelihood. It's ignoring all the fancy Bayesian posterior prior discussion. It's just taking the data generating process and maximizing that with respect to the parameter. That's the maximum likelihood one. Um, typically, they are quite similar. So the map estimator converges against the MLE. Yeah? If we've seen lots of data, why is that the case? Yeah, basically now seeing the data is like multiplying from the left more and more likelihoods to these terms. So the last term here becomes more and more irrelevant. So the prior gets overruled after a while. So if you have enough data or if you are interested in asymptotics and you make a convergence analysis, you can prove that the maximum likelihood um, estimator will do the right thing or will also do the same thing as the map estimate. Okay. So the prior gets irrelevant if I see lots of data. However, if I don't have so much data, yeah, then maybe it's helpful. Suppose you are having a coin and you throw it twice, and it's showing twice heads. So then the maximum likelihood estimator would say the probability of seeing heads is 1.0. However, you have some prior knowledge about coins that sometimes it's falling on the other side. So you should use that knowledge, and then you are a bit more careful, maybe after seeing doing it twice, you would say it's 0 0.9, but there is a possibility of seeing the other side too. Okay? So if you don't have so much data, this Bayesian thing, if you can do it, might be better. Both point estimates ignore the variance of the distribution, and we will see an application where we don't, uh, where we don't ignore the variance and where that is super useful not to do. So what does it mean to ignore something here? So being Bayesian, I put in a prior, which is a strong assumption, no question about it, but when you do it, you get a posterior out of this. And the posterior gives you much more information than just its maximum. It also tells you how sure you are. So example with throwing a coin, suppose you throw 10 times and you see A times head, it will be something like 0 0.8. But if you throw it uh, 10,000 times and you see 8,000 times head, you have more information, right? So you should be much more safe about this estimate. So the variance tells you something how sure you are about this estimation. And both estimators ignore it, okay? Because they take a simple summary of statistics. Um, again, nonetheless, often map is useful if the posterior is peaked and it's very common, okay? And maximum likelihood, super simple, often preferable because Sometimes people don't want to write down a prior, and sometimes people don't want to be Bayesian, and then they just do the maximum likelihood estimation, which is totally fine. Good. Here's a question, yes. Yeah, oh yeah, it is Bayes' rule, and I omitted the evidence, which is just a function of the data. So I omitted the divided by P of D, and I was allowed to omit it because I'm maximizing over the theta. So the divided by P of the data is independent of the theta, so the argmax does not change. The maximum will change, but because I have this argmax, yeah, I'm only interested in the, at the, for the location, and it doesn't change if I change the scaling. Very good point. So this argmax, um, it looks always so arglos, I don't know what it's in English, but it changes the way of the stuff that you're allowed to do under it. So you can remove constants, for example, yeah? so they become irrelevant. irrelevant. Good point. Okay, here comes a famous, um, not machine learning estimator, a famous maximum likelihood estimator for Gaussian likelihoods. And you know it all and you have used it all, or maybe not, but I think you know about it. And um, now having these probabilities here, we can kind of have a, have a more 
um, founded, a better founded description of what we are actually doing, okay? So consider Gaussian distributed data points, so they're all sampled from a Gaussian distribution, where here the I means identity matrix, okay? It's like saying the variance is one, but for multivariate. We want to estimate the mean. Um, it doesn't matter whether I'm doing it here multivariate or not, but if I maximize now the likelihood, then basically I'm doing the argmax of this probability when I now, I can apply a monotonically increasing function without changing anything since I'm under the argmax. I'm changing the max, but not the argument of the max. So I can modify it with the logarithm. It's also already fine because probabilities are greater than zero, so everything is fine. I can apply the logarithm. Next, I plug in my density function here, which is that one. So logarithm of a product is always something very convenient, right? Since it's kind of um, switching places with the product and then the, the product becomes a summation. Then there's this constant here, one divided by um, two pi something. It's just a constant. So it's becoming like, just like something that is added since if I have logarithm of a product, it's like logarithm of the first factor plus logarithm of the second factor. And again, that's something I can omit under the argmax if they, I have plus a constant, okay? So I can also omit that one. Then I have logarithm of the E function. That works out very nicely if I take the natural logarithm. And what remains is minus a half in this squared distance here. So there's no covariance function uh, because I have chosen it to be the identity matrix. And now changing the max to a min, I get rid of the minus sign, and we see that the maximum likelihood estimator is exactly the same as the method of least squares. So what does this tell us now? It tells us if you are using least squares, because it's just so convenient, you can calculate the derivative, and it's what everyone else is doing, you could now interpret what you're doing, yeah? Basically, you are having assumptions that your data is Gaussian distributed. So you can reasoning upwards here. So if you are applying least squares, it's like saying that your data is Gaussian distributed. Or more precisely, that the error on your data is Gaussian distributed, okay? Even if you know your data is coming from totally different uh, distributions, sometimes method of least squares is a good idea because it's like a um, approximation to the real thing that you actually want to do, right? It's like approximating the real density with the Gaussian and then doing maximum likelihood. That's the same as applying the method of least square. So what I'm just saying is, don't just use thoughtlessly least square, then when you use it, do the inverse inference and think about what assumptions does it apply on your model, okay? If you haven't thought about it. So that's quite interesting. What else do we have? Oh, some naming conventions. So people sometimes write map, and they mean the map estimator. People then sometimes write MLE, and they mean the maximum likelihood estimator. So sometimes there's an E, sometimes there's no E. That's just a big mess, okay? Be clever when you read it, okay? So actually map is maximum posterior, ML is maximum likelihood, and there are different approximations for it, okay? Uh, different names for it. Here are some further insights. What is maximum likelihood? Another interesting insight that I find interesting is that maximum likelihood is minimizing the negative log likelihood. But this should be clear by now. Maybe I should put the slide before the other one because we use this trick already. But so basically, maximizing the probability here is the same as maximizing the log probability because the logarithm is monotonic and we're having the arc in front of our maximum. And by changing the uh, sign here, it's like, taking the minimum of this. So this is the same thing. So negative log likelihood looks a bit arbitrary. Why does it appear sometimes in paper? Why do people talk about the negative log likelihood? For this reason, they are talking about the maximum likelihood approach, but they want to be basically on the scale of the data, right? So here basically we are talking about, if you talk about units, we are minimizing the squared distance of the data points, okay? And that corresponds, this expression corresponds to the negative log likelihood, okay? So the negative log likelihood is proportional to the squared distances of your data for a Gaussian distribution. What else can we say? Map can be also viewed as a regularized version of 
maximum likelihood. So what do I mean by that? If I write it out using base rule and omit the p of d um, and apply my logarithms, then I suddenly get something like that, where we've seen that the negative log likelihood is something like a least square term, and then minus some other term where I'm basically now penalizing certain values of theta additionally. Okay? So I cannot omit this term here because it depends on theta. Yeah? And this is actually what you do in optimization when you regularize. So what does it mean when you are a numerical person and you say, now I'm regularizing, I'm putting something on the diagonal, I'm doing this or that, then everything is numerically more stable. Actually, what you're doing is you're doing Bayesian inference and you're doing a map estimate and you're having a certain prior here. Okay? So if you regularize for a certain reason, you could think about what assumptions does it pose on my model. So you say, I'm not a Bayesian, I, I'm doing classical stuff, and, but here I'm regularizing because otherwise it's inconvenient. Then you might be a Bayesian. Maybe then you are doing maximum a posteriori with a particular assumption. Okay? So that's another curious insight. Let's further compare the estimators here that we have. Okay? So suppose we want to estimate the mean of a Gaussian distribution, and here I'm also putting parameters since I want to do some calculations. So I will put prior mean now, totally arbitrary choice, saying it's zero. It could be something else, right? It could be 1 meter 80 if it's about height of people. Um, and then I have some fixed variance. And similarly, my measurement device, my Solstock, my yardstick, has a certain variance because I bought a cheap one, OK? So there's a certain variance on it. And then given that typical person has a certain height, what will be my measurement? They are Gaussian distributed and blah, 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 blah. So if I now look at these equations from before, then for the map estimate here, yeah, I can derive that minimizing the negative log likelihood minus my regularization term turns out to be exactly this expression where you might recognize now, oh, interesting, this is least square where I'm regularizing with an L2. Okay, so this is like L2 regularization here. That's quite interesting. And then there's this curious lambda in front of it. And you might be wondering, by the way, how do I choose this regularization constant? You fiddle around with it, right? And that's how we also do it, of course. But you fiddle around with it, and typically you don't have an interpretation for it. But in this example, you see exactly what it is. It is the ratio of the two variances. Or it is uh, the ratio of basically uh, I think noise to signal, is it right? Noise to signal ratio? Yeah, maybe not, maybe not really. But it is, it has a meaning. So when the lambda is large, you're regularizing strongly, which corresponds to a large variance in your measure, measuring, okay? Or a very small variance in your prior mean. Small variance in your prior mean means you are super confident, yeah, what the mu is without seeing any data. That means you will increase the lambda very much, OK? If you are not so sure, you just want to have some stability. You have a small lambda that might correspond to a larger tau and to a smaller sigma. You're more trusting your measurements, OK? So what do I want to tell you here? In this slide, I want to say something very common, like L2 regularization has a nice interpretation when you think about probabilistic models, OK? So that's quite interesting. Then, of course, you can do the same thing for the maximum likelihood estimate, and you can also solve this argmin, and it's just the average of all values. That's just how it is. So what is it if you regularize? It's 1 divided by n plus lambda. That's curious, because this now we can interpret again. When you remember for the beta binomial model, the a and b, they could be interpreted like observations that we had before. Yeah? If we increase the a and the b, it would say, we have seen already something yesterday. Okay, So that's how we could increase it. Similarly here, if I have a large lambda, it's like saying, I have lots of observations where my mu was equal to 0, or where my x's were equal to 0. right? Because this summation, suppose lambda is 100, you could extend this, ex ex uh, this summation to n plus 100 by adding 100 zeros to it. 
And you could go through the mass here, and if you put something else than zero up here, it will correspond to exactly z. 1 divided by n plus lambda, and then you open a bracket, you sum up the x1, and you have um, lambda times the mean that is written up here. So this regularization can be seen like there have been already observations with outcome zero in this case. So for your pleasure, I worked it out here. So if lambda equals one, okay, basically it means that the variances are the same for the prior and the likelihood. And this is like adding a single older observation of x zero being equal to zero. And similar for two and a hundred, okay? So then it has some interesting interpretation. Curiously, also the maximum likelihood estimator can be interpreted as map with lambda equals zero, which corresponds to tau being equal to infinity. So tau was the variance of your prior. And having an infinite variance, of course, is not possible for a Gaussian distribution, but intuitively means that it's like completely uninformed. You have no preference about any value. So there is nice interpretations of all these things. So time is running fast, as always. Um, any questions so far? Yeah? Yes. Ah, this one? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's, uh, the notation is not very good, so let me put it on the board. Um, that's a, I wrote it in that way so that people will recognize, oh, that's my L2 regularization I used yesterday. But actually, basically what it says is um, the, it's just mu transpose times mu, where the mu is now a vector, so just the L2 norm, okay? Yeah, I, I could have put here also maybe the bars. Maybe that would be more consistent, right? To put also there the absolute values there. Yeah. So that would be nicer. Yeah, yeah, so the, it's not written up very well. So please um, text me on Rocket Chat, and then I won't forget it, and I, I make it nicer, okay? Okay, valid questions. Yeah, it's acting on the whole on the whole thing. So up to here. So the thing is, I mean, now being again a computer scientist, so the mu is like, or the argument is a op, is a, a variable binding operator like the summation sign, where you have a variable i being equal to one to n. Then the i is only defined under the summation. Similarly, here the mu is only defined under the in the open, in the input for the argument, and so the lambda mu here must be part of the argument. Otherwise, the mu wouldn't be defined at all. Okay? Good. Any more questions? There are, I'm sure, but um, let's continue anyway. So, what, which estimator should I now use? Should I use the, the map or the ML? Um, there's Bayesian decision theory which is a way how to, so basically Bayesian decision theory now tells us how to choose your estimator, okay? And I will briefly explain to you what it means. So as Bayesians, we would turn priors into posteriors, okay? So that's our business, that's how we work. We start with a prior, see data, and we turn it, our prior into a posterior. How do we now change, uh, how do, can we now our beliefs, which are now expressed as a posterior, our updated beliefs, how we convert it into actions, where actions now meaning having a point estimate, okay? For this, we are defining a loss function. So we must say, how expensive is it to be wrong? And then we can say, this function should be minimized. And if we do that, we get an estimator, which is a point estimate, a one that will minimize a certain loss function. So let's do that. Um, we write the loss as a function with two inputs. So one, where there's a true parameter, theta, sometimes it's also called theta star, here we just use theta, and then there's our estimate typically getting a hat. So that is our estimate that we want, where we take the minimum width later on, 
and the theta is the true parameter, which we don't have, but we can go through the mass. Now, given the posterior distribution, um, we pick that set uh, theta hat that minimizes the posterior expected loss. And this is now just a description of the formula. So I take the expectation of my loss, so this is an expected value, where I take as a random variable the theta without the hat, and I have a distribution for the theta, which is my posterior. So I'm integrating out this variable theta here. Okay? And this is giving me a function which looks like a p, but it's not a probability here, it's a rho, okay? So it, it's not a, the letter p. It's a rho of theta hat. So this is not a probability distribution anymore. Why not? Because the, the loss has unit dollars, right? And so the, the rho has suddenly the unit dollars as well. And, and for that reason, kind of, it doesn't make sense that it's a probability. It's really something that you want to minimize or maximize, depending on what you want. So now, having defined this rho of theta hat, we can define the base estimator, which is like a schema to get different estimators, yeah? or it's also sometimes called the base decision rule, to be the argument of this rho function. And now for different choices of my loss function, I get different estimators, okay? So that is Bayesian decision theory. And it's a very short description of it, yeah? But there you see where comes the loss function and so on and so forth. So here are a couple of examples. There's a so-called zero one loss which says, I'm only happy, so paying zero dollars, yeah, if I'm exactly right. If I'm wrong, I pay a dollar, okay? So that's it. So by the way, I think, in statistics, you talk about loss function. In economics, you talk about gains or win or something. I think there are sometimes, but it's just a different sign. So here we are minimizing the loss, or you can maximize your profit. It's the same thing. So curiously, if you plug this thing into the integral and do the math, it turns out you will get the map estimator that we introduced before, which is the maximum of your posterior. Then there's the quadratic loss, also interesting, the squared error, very common that people use that one. If that is your loss function, you will get the posterior mean, and you could also plug in the so-called robust loss, which um, is made with the L1 loss, okay, just the absolute value of the difference, and then you get the posterior median. So that's quite curious. So you can take the posterior and you can derive a whole series of estimators from it depending on what your loss function is, okay? Now, just as a simple example why sometimes the median is a good idea, so you are at a big conference in a hotel room and you are thinking about, theoretically, where should I stand in front of the elevator? So there are lots of elevators, and suppose they are like distributed on the real line, okay? So they are like different elevators, and you don't know which elevator is coming next. So where should you place yourself, okay? So you are in your conference mode, so everything is math and everything is computer science. So where should you stand? And curiously, you should use, in this case, the L1 loss, because you want to minimize the way that you need to walk from the position where you are to the next elevator. So this is a nice example for the L1 loss where you need it. And in practice, there are many other situations. You wouldn't minimize the L2 loss because that's not what you're paying. You're paying only the energy for walking once to the elevator and then you get in. That's why it's just the L1 loss, okay? So just as an example. Summary of the point estimators that we've seen. I hope I'm, I, I can show you something else in a second, just it, but it's not much. Let's first summarize the point estimators. So we've seen the MLE or the ML estimator, which is just maximizing the likelihood. Then there are Bayesian estimators, okay? And they can be all derived from Bayesian decision theory or Bayes decision theory, yeah? And what it will be at the end, there are three different ones that we derived, but if you have another loss function, you will get another, op uh, another estimator, okay? So it depends on your loss function what estimator you get. So for these choices here, for the zero one loss, we get the map. For the quadratic loss, we get the posterior mean, which is also interesting, and it's not always the maximum. If you have like a distribution which is not symmetric, the mean will not be the maximum, okay? And you can also get the posterior median of your distribution, which can be expressed like this, that like the, the possibilities on the left side get the same weight as the possibilities on the right side. So this is the summary of point estimators. However, 
Let me explain to you in a couple of minutes what else you can do with the posteriors. Um, it's shorter than the other stuff that I explained. So it's only a, a very brief section in here. So actually, don't we just use point estimates? So why do you want to have more? So point estimates are what we actually want to have. We want to make a decision and setting a certain parameter. So in your company, they say, this is my loss function. And then please calculate me a point estimate. And then we set it up in the way that you estimate it. But there are sometimes situations where you want more. For example, you want to do prediction. There is a posterior predictive distribution. And these wordings are getting more and more complicated and more and more big. But they are very descriptive. So you want to have a predictive distribution. That means you want to predict the distribution of what you see next. So you throw 10 times a, a coin. And then you are not interested at all in the parameter, but you want to predict what is the probability distribution of my next coin flip. So that is something very practical. Who cares whether it's theta equal to 0.4 or theta being equal to 0.5? I want to predict the outcome of my next coin flip. Also in a company, that's what you want. You've collected some data, and then you want to predict the future. So how much stuff will be bought tomorrow, right? You don't care for the parameter of your model. And this can be done with a posterior predictive distribution, where you use the posterior of your parameter. And then again, you integrate out the parameter to get the posterior predictive distribution. So having seen the data, your posterior will express a distribution, not a single value, of your parameters. Um, now by integrating out, basically, um, the parameter, I get the probability distribution of the next sample, the next data point, given that I've seen the data. So let's look at this in detail. <clears throat> the first step is just the sum rule. I'm summing out the theta parameter. OK, so that's the sum rule. Let's look at the next step. The next step is just the product rule. However, there's a comma d missing here. OK, in principle, it would be the product rule if the comma d would be there. However, when you draw a graph for this, a graphical model, you will find out that the x and the given data is independent of each other once you know the exact parameter. So if I tell you my coin has 0.4 success probability, you don't care for the observations anymore. Okay? So they get independent. That's why we omit the d over here. Okay? So this is a very interesting distribution, which is very practical. And you can only calculate it because you are having a whole distribution for the parameter and not only a single point estimate. Of course, you could say, oh, let's do a point estimate. And then I just plug it into my likelihood, and I get a probability of observing the next one. By this, you are ignoring the variances of your posterior, for example. Okay? So here, we would get a whole spread around the different possible outcomes. And if you just take a point estimate for a parameter, plug it into the likelihood, you also just get a point estimate for your outcome here. OK? Good. Um, well, how much is there still coming? Let me just see. Um, OK, I will do this next time. But I want to give you this really nice example. No, how much is this here? Uh, no, I, I show you the example, and after that, we are done. So this is an example that you need for the exercises. And it's another example why it's nice to have the full posterior. So here's the story. You want to buy something on this big site. Maybe I should replace the name, whatever. Um, and they have positive and negative review, reviews. Yeah? It could be also on eBay. So suppose there's one seller, and the person has um, 90 positive and 10 negative reviews. And then there's another one, and the other one has two positive and zero negative. So what would be your intuition? Of course, maybe you would buy by the bigger one who has sold more stuff, right? But in principle, if you just do maximum likelihood estimation here, you would say, OK, the second one is better, right? So if I estimate the probability of success for that one, I would say 2 divided by 2, it's 1.0. For the other one, it's 90 divided by 100, so it's 0 0.9. OK, so it's worse. And again, the situation is that I don't have enough data. However, with Bayesian inference, I could do more. So let's apply our beta binomial models here. So we just can write it down, because we've seen it so often. The um, posterior about the reliability, so the theta parameter now I interpret as reliability of my seller, yeah, is distributed according to a beta distribution. 
where my prior was A being equal to 1, B being equal to 1, just having a uniform prior, and then the beta distribution of the posterior is just having the parameters 91 and 11. And the other one for the um, other cellar will be a beta distribution with 3 and 1. Now, I'm interested in the probability that theta 1 is greater than theta 2, okay, given that I have this data set. So I want to calculate this integration here down here. Okay, and that can be done, and it will turn out to be 0 0.7. So, with probability 0 0.7, the first seller is better than the second one. Okay, now you're wondering, how do you do this? Uh, do we really have to do this integration with these Iverson brackets? No, here you are using numerical integration. Okay, that's how you do it. And um, the solution to that one is just a Jupyter notebook, which I won't show you but it's in the public folder. So that's a way to calculate some weird Gaussian integration. And basically, you are, you are using the same trick to do the calculation, but with beta distributions, OK? So here, I'm having a Gaussian distribution, and I'm interested in the integral over that weird-looking area, yeah, where the one diagonal is something like one cell is better than the other. But I'm, I made another shape, OK? And the curious thing is, how do you solve it? You just sample from one distribution, you sample from the other distribution, and then you calculate the mean of some logical expression. That's it. So, back to the slides, how do you solve this? You sample 10,000 theta 1s, and you sample 10,000 theta 2 from your beta distributions, and then you ask how often was theta 1 greater than theta 2? And that is giving you a 71% number here, OK? And I find this example super cool. So I didn't came up with it. I guess here David Barber came up with it in that section. So that's quite a nice example. And it will be your homework, OK? Next time, I will fill in some missing holes here. And I will tell you why map is sometimes dangerous, OK? Where dangerous basically means really doing something stupid. So Depending on the parameterization, you get different results, which is weird. Anyway, so that's it for today. Thanks for being here. I see you on Monday. Oh, thanks for being here. I see you on Wednesday.